Okay, uh, welcome everyone to the 174th uh, NILUG meeting. Uh, the astute observer might have recognized that last month was 181. Uh, we're going back to 174 because this was a talk that was rescheduled from the end of last year. Uh, it had to be rescheduled due to weather. Uh, tonight we're going to be hearing from Patrick McGarry uh, on what's new with Ceph, a distributed object, uh, a distributed object store, block store, and file system. Uh, this is our third meeting here at Bloomberg, and we'd like to thank Bloomberg for being so gracious to host us here. I'd like to thank our uh, other sponsors, IBM, Canonical, Brandor Group, Google, and O'Reilly Media for their continued support throughout the years. And of course, Nalog wouldn't be able to do what it is today without the gracious time of all of our volunteers. All right, without any further ado, uh, Petra McGarry, what's new with Ceph? Thanks, thanks. All right, hey everybody. Uh, uh, here to talk about Ceph. Uh, how many people raise a hand, uh, know what Ceph is, have heard about it? Um, all right, so we'll breeze through the architecture overview pretty quick then and get just to what's going on. Cool. Um, who I am? Patrick McGarry. Um, I've been hanging out at uh, Ink Tank, uh, now acquired by Red Hat. Uh, hooray for some people and others are, have big question marks, so hopefully we can answer some of those tonight. Um, I'm the director of community. Uh, I'm the guy you usually hear yammering on at the uh, Ceph Developer Summits on Google Hangouts and things like that. Um, run a lot of our outreach for the developers and everything. Um, I started life a long time ago at Slashdot. I was Scuttlemonkey then and still am now. Um, I don't work for Slashdot anymore, obviously. Uh, but then I, I kind of went out into the corporate world, uh, played with Alcatel, Lucent, and Perforce a little bit, tried to bring them a little of the open source gospel, uh, and now I'm back at Ink Tank and, and the open source world, and it feels like coming home. So that's a hooray for me. Um, I, I guess uh, we'll jump right into it. Um, this is what we're going to be doing. So I figured we'd go over a couple of industry musings. Um, there's, there, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of FUD out there about storage and various pieces, but uh, there's definitely some really cool trends, uh, and I'm really excited about where open source is taking the, uh, the storage industry as a whole. Um, we'll talk a little bit about an intro to Ceph, kind of where it came from a little bit of its history uh, for those that don't know about it. Um, and then, like I said, there's a, a big section in the middle uh, that's the architecture overview. Uh, I'll try not to spend a ton of time on that, so it looks like we have a lot of veterans here. Um, but you know, maybe if we're breezing through it really quickly, then you guys can uh, make it a little bit more interactive. We can ask questions uh, and dive a little deeper into the pieces that, uh, that you have questions about. And then we'll talk about uh, my piece, uh, the community, what's going on, what's happening. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff going on. It uh, turns out uh, when you take a little piece of, of something like Ceph uh, and you drop it into a giant bucket of rocket fuel that is all of the resources of Red Hat, uh, lots of things can happen that hadn't been able to before. Um, and then I can mention kind of the commercial stuff on the, the very end, um, but we won't spend a lot of time about that because I'm more about the open source. Uh, so here, uh, looking forward, uh, and these numbers are actually pretty old. Um, a study was done, uh, I won't give you all the sightings, but 2020, uh, they're expecting uh, over 15 zettabytes of storage to be used in the industry. Um, they're actually thinking that this is probably quite a bit uh, of an underestimation uh, looking forward as things continue to kind of exponentially explode uh, as we're going on. So definitely a good place to be uh, for storage folks. Uh, unfortunately, you know, budgets, as we all know, don't quite grow as fast uh, as the needs. Uh, so. Uh, well, you know, the, 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 you got to come up with new ways to do things. You can't sit there and, and do the same old uh, giant big black box forklift. You know, you uh, subscribe to somebody uh, and then they ask you to pay for your, with your uh, firstborn. You got to keep having children to get IT infrastructure and that's just never a good plan. Um, so, you know, we're, we're kind of past this, the scale up and we're going to go out into the scale out. Um, it's something that, you know, as open source folks, uh, we've been kind of tooting on this horn for a long time. You know, commodity hardware, uh, do it cheap, uh, plan for failure as the norm as opposed to the exception, uh, that kind of thing. You know, all of the, the nice uh, mantras that got Google and Amazon to where they are uh, and on many of the people in this room's uh, back, I'm sure. So, a little bit about Ceph, where'd it come from? Uh, Ceph started actually a long time ago, 2004 uh, is when the first code, well, I think the first code was written in 2003, uh, but did, didn't actually get checked in until 2004. Um, it started as a uh, project out of a Department of Energy grant uh, that Sage Weil, our founder and architect, uh, he started this as a part of his doctoral research at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, and actually, that's where the name comes from. If we'll take a quick aside, I know I get that question a lot. Ceph, as in cephalopod, uh, because the mascot at UC Santa Cruz was Sammy the Banana Slug. 
and uh, Sage wanted to keep it uh, at least kind of in kind uh, with, with where he was doing all this good work. And so that's where Ceph came from. And then Ink Tank came kind of as a result of that. Um, the funny part about this is when he started writing code, uh, it was part, as I said, it was part of a Department of Energy grant. So he was uh, working at Los Alamos National Laboratory. So he was actually going to a secure facility. He had a little radiation badge. He had to like badge in and security, guys with M16s, all the crazy stuff. And he would go into the base and he would sit down in his little cubicle and he would write open source code and check it in over SSH back to the subversion server at the university. So it was a little strange. <laughs> Um, and then in 2006 is when he finally kind of pushed it out into the world. Um, this is where I usually take a minute to talk about the licensing. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the license of Ceph, it's LGP version 2, uh, LGPL version 2. Um, and it's actually got a, a unique twist that Sage threw in there. It's, uh, we have a fra deliberately fragmented copyright, uh, which means that anybody that commits code to Ceph owns that contribution forever and whatever. Uh, so that means that if anyone, a giant megacorp that just bought uh, Ceph, for instance, <laughs> wanted to change the licensing on it, uh, they would actually have to go in and get every single contributor uh, that had ever contributed to Ceph to sign off and say, yeah, sure, you can make that proprietary and charge me money for it. That's cool. Uh, so unlikely that that would ever happen. <laughs> so uh, it, was, it was really, really good thinking of Sage, uh, and it's, it's been really fun working with him. He is very much the idealist, uh, which has been awesome for us guys in the community. Uh, not always as awesome for guys trying to make money with it, but thankfully we did all right there. Uh, 2010 was actually when we made it into the mainline Linux kernel. Uh, 2.6.34, I think, is when the first ones hit. Uh, 2.6.39 is when kind of the giant suite of fun functionality hit and was uh, available for all pieces. That was big for us. That was when we started to see a lot of adoption and testing uh, not only just within our own community, but the, uh, the larger Linux file system gurus kind of started pushing it out, and we saw a really big uptick. So that was fun. And in 2011, uh, we kind of did our song and dance with OpenStack, uh, and that's when the, kind of the neutron bomb hit. So that was awesome. Uh, we launched Ink Tank in May 2012, because uh, we were getting a lot of guys from larger companies that were, kind of, were coming to DreamHost, They'd knock on Sage's door and they'd say, hey, can you help us figure this stuff out or can we like, pay you some money and, and help us and support and stuff? Uh, almost exactly like that. Um, <laughs> and Sage finally said, okay, it's time to be a big boy company. Uh, let's get out there and help people uh, do something real with this technology that we've been kind of incubating for the last eight years. Uh, so then we saw the production ready Ceph uh, that you now know and, and hopefully love uh, in September of 2012. Uh, so it's been kind of a long road coming, uh, but it's been amazing, you know, and ever since kind of the OpenStack point, it's just been an inflection point and kind of the hockey stick after that. Uh, so, you know, we also saw things like the cloud stack integration and the, the Zen stuff. So, I mean, there's lots of stuff that's coming down the pipe. Uh, and then we launched our first commercial product uh, in October of 2013. Uh, this was kind of the first time we really thought about oh, okay, we need to be a real company, we're looking for investors, and they said, well, you need something that you actually hand to somebody. Uh, you can't just be a support company, no one's gonna give you money for that. And so then we kind of packaged up this whole thing and said, hey, this is Ink Tank Stuff Enterprise, uh, pay money and, and we'll do a whole song and dance for you and it's awesome. And then we threw in the RHEL support, uh, which kind of apparently drew some interest. So, so what is Ceph? Uh, the, the real thing that we started to look at here was kind of, um, a lot of what drove Sage to build Ceph was, I mean, he was a dream host. He was one of the founders of dream host, so he was tired of paying lots and lots and lots of money for storage. And, you know, every time he'd play a bazillion dollars and they would give him this giant black box and say, it's storage, it's magic, enjoy. Uh, and he was the kind of guy that wanted to see the guts and do things with it and make it stand on its head, and he couldn't. Uh, so the whole kind of purpose of this was to get away from that. Um, moving from, instead of proprietary hardware to you know, the, the commodity hardware, the any day, every day type of hardware, uh, sitting with open source software instead of proprietary software, and then if you want, the enterprise products and services that sit on top, not, hey, we're gonna put the thumb screws to you and lock you in. So that was kind of the, the difference between the two um, and, and where we were headed. Uh, so now how do we do this? Um, I guess the first thing is I should talk about some of the principles that Sage had that were kind of driving principles behind Ceph. Uh, you have things like no single point of failure. I mean, it may sound like a no-brainer, 
but Sage really took it to the next level. I mean, even all the way down to the CephFS portion, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, he wanted to say even like the metadata servers needed to be able to scale horizontally and be no single point of failure. And like even in, if you look at a lot of open source options out there like Hadoop, like for a long time, I know we've got some Hadoop heads in here, that single name node architecture, <coughs> tell me you didn't have some pain, right? Yeah, so Sage wanted to try and get away from that and kind of just rethink and flip the whole thing on its head. And so he started with an object store, uh, which we can get into here. Uh, so if you look at this, this is kind of a general overview of what Ceph comprise, or what comprises Ceph, all the pieces, right? The very bottom, you've got Rados. Uh, Rados is our, it's our object store. It's where everything goes into. It's what holds it all and what has all the magic. Uh, this is, uh, it's a, uh, self-healing, self-managing, uh, takes a lot of the day-to-day -day problems that as a storage admin that you would have and kind of handles it on its own. Um, I was kind of new to the storage world when I started playing with Ceph and hacking around with, with Sage and the guys and, and when I started talking to storage admins, it really surprised me because they would tell me things like, well, Every n terabytes equals a new headcount. It's a new storage admin because we grew and had more storage. Uh, it just kind of blew me away. I'm like, really? You, you can't automate that? You can't do some magic? Um, but Sage did. He did some magic. And so DreamHost was our first, it was our first large customer, first production deployment. Um, they built Dream Objects. It was, it's now an Amazon S3 competitor. Uh, the, the guy that ran that, and it was a five petabyte cluster, they now have two of them, and they're looking to build a third, potentially. Uh, the guy, hmm? five, petabytes? five petabytes. So it was two five petabyte clusters, one for Dream Objects and one that's coming for Dream Compute. Uh, it was actually run by one guy part time. So I tell that to store these storage admins that were telling me these these stories about how they had to have new headcount for new storage, and they just kind of look at me and they don't really believe me. But it is pretty amazing all the stuff that it can do. Um, so on top of Rados, uh, well, I guess we can get into that. Rados, um, it's a, a reliable, autonomous, distributed object store, Rados. Uh, so that's where everything goes, right? It's what everything is built on top of. And it looks like this. And, and what this means is in Ceph, you've got a bunch of disks, right? And uh, this was one of the acronyms that I really loved learning when I first started doing storage, JBOD, right? Just a bunch of disks. And so that's what you've got. You've got a whole bunch of machines with just a bunch of disks. And that is what comprises your, your Rados cluster. And so what you do to make it a Rados cluster is for a long time when we first started things, we had our own file system that would sit on top of the disks. It was called eBOFs. Uh, we spent, uh, early on they spent a lot of time working on this and they realized that we're reinventing the wheel. This is stupid. We've got the guys that are doing ext4 and XFS and, and ultimately we want to call the ButterFS place home, but you know, it's not production ready yet and well, it's been not production ready yet for like the what, last 10 years? <laughs> but uh, it'll get there someday, we hope. Uh, so on top of that, we, we would put a file system, some Linux file system. Most of our production customers are running on XFS. Uh, on top of that file system is a software daemon. It's your object storage daemon. And it's just a piece of software that you run. Typically, we have one daemon per physical hardware disk. Uh, and then these are the things that are doing the peering and putting everything together for the clustering. They're the ones that handle all the rebalancing, and they're the things that are actually in your data path, the only thing that are actually in your data path. And so you have a whole bunch of these OSDs in a cluster, uh, and then you'll notice kind of any application that talks to a Rados cluster doesn't care that it's a whole bunch of things, it just treats it as a single logical object, or a single logical unit, I should say. Um, now, what you did notice that there were a few other types in there that weren't the OSDs. These are your monitors. These are the guys that are hurting, hurting all the cats. Um, they're the ones that are in charge of maintaining things like state, uh, who's in, who's out, who's up, who's down. Uh, they handle the authentication stuff. They are not in the data path. Um, usually it's just a small, odd number of these monitors that will kind of be the glue for your cluster. Uh, so what these guys do uh, is they actually have a Paxos algorithm that they use to make decisions, right? If you have, because as I said, all of the OSDs are peering. They're talking to each other. So that means they can also report when they think that, hey, that jerk OSD 42, he is down. And, you know, somebody on the other side of the cluster can say, no, no, I can talk to him, fine, it's cool. 
Uh, so they would gather all of these polls together and decide, well, no, 47 is being a jerk, kick him out. Uh, so that's kind of what the monitors do. Um, and then we'll get into how the data path works, but the OSDs, that's where your data lives. Uh, so there's a number of different ways that you can store things in a cluster. And most, well, there's, I guess there's three main ways you can think about it, right? There's the, it's that single name node problem I talked about. You want to put something in a cluster, you're going to go right down. Okay, I put it at this place. All right. That one turns out there's scaling issues for that. Who do? Uh, the other way is that you can turn it into what I call the phone book approach, right? Kind of a logical distribution of data across your cluster. The problem that you run into with this is that if you have an outage or you want to shuffle your data, there's a lot of things that need to move potentially as you shuffle your data. Uh, so this becomes very network intensive, I guess, among other things. Now, this is where Crush comes in. Crush is the magical algorithm that makes Ceph the hotness. Uh, it's controlled replication under scalable hashing. Uh, it's awesome. <laughs> I, am, I am constantly surprised at how much it can do and how simple it is. Um, Sage, for a long, long time, has been just urging people, like, let's do more stuff with Crush. Crush is cool, because Crush is the big thesis paper that he wrote and published when he did his doctorate. Um, and he'd really like to do more with it, but he just doesn't have the time. Uh, but the way that Crush works is it is a, it's a, like I said, it's an algorithm. And so what happens is when you push data into your cluster, uh, you split it up into logical chunks. We call them placement groups. They're the buckets where you drop your data. And what will happen is it will actually take a few things, a few pieces of information. So you've got your cluster state, right? What is the status of your cluster? Who's up, who's down, how many, and where do they live, et cetera, et cetera. And you've also got a thing called your crush map. This is the thing that you get to build that makes Crush so cool. What it is, is is a logical representation of your physical infrastructure. So you get to say, I have n machines in y rows in x, data, or, uh, x power circuits or whatever. Like You can kind of create your own failure domains. And then you get to make rules for how your data is distributed across these physical hosts. You can say, I want three copies of my data, but no two copies can live in the same row in my data center. Uh, so now you've all of a sudden started creating uh, the appropriate amounts of redundancy. And what Crush does is it takes that status of your cluster, the Crush map, which you've just defined, and a hash of, of the object that you're putting in. Using those three things, it does a reliably uh, pseudo-random, I should say. It's, it's not random, it's pseudo-random. Uh, placement of your data within the cluster. Now what this means is you see a very even distribution of your data, and if you have things like outages or you want to change where your data lives or, or something like that, it only has to shuffle a very small amount of your data. So you're not seeing these giant migrations of, well, one host went down and, and now 50% of my data has to sh shift one machine to the right or something. Uh, so no musical chairs in your data center. So that's what Crush does. Now, what this means uh, is that also we no longer have to go through a bottleneck to get into uh, the cluster. So now each of your clients, all it has to do is a very quick calculation and it knows where I have to put the data and then when it goes back, it knows, well, this is where it is based on the calculation. And that calculation, because it involves the cluster map, the status, who's up and who's down, if it changes, well, then the output will obviously be the new location of the data, and the OSDs have already handled the movement of the data uh, and rebalanced everything so it's where you would expect. So Crush, really cool, I guess, is what you could take away from that. Uh, so sitting on top of Rados, which is this magic layer, uh, is Libratos. It's just a software library. Uh, we've got lots of different flavors, C, C++, Java, PHP, uh, a lot of different bindings that you can use if you feel like rolling your own. So I have an application and I want to put stuff in Ceph, but I don't want to use your interfaces because I want to do it at the lowest level because um, it's got a, a really, really fast um, messaging protocol that you can use to talk to the cluster instead of going with the overhead of like, you know, the, the RESTful overhead or dealing with a block device or things, something like that. So you can actually use Liberatos, plug your application directly into the object cluster. And I've seen some really cool experiments with this, uh, but most people choose to do one of the things on top of it, because yeah, it's that socket connection uh, for Libratos. 
Uh, yeah, we touched on that already. So on top of Libretos, which we used because that was the easiest way to get into the cluster, uh, we have three main interfaces that we use to expose your object cluster. We've got Rados Gateway. This is our S3 and Swift compatible uh, RESTful gateway that you can use for object storage. Uh, we've also got the Rados block device, RBD. Uh, it's a thinly provisioned block device uh, that will allow you to you know, store uh, machine images or, or boot VMs or whatever, you know, it's a standard block device. Uh, and CephFS, um, which is our distributed file system, uh, which, so if I had to re refer to these three things, I would say Rados Gateway and the Rados Block Device are really awesome. CephFS is nearly awesome. <laughs> so uh, being a very small startup for a long time, or as long as we were, uh, we had to make some decisions. And because the OpenStack world was a, like I said, a neutron bomb on kind of the inbound stuff of people asking questions for Ceph, uh, we had to choose to focus on something. And turns out, cloud scenario, mostly object and block. So that's where we focused all of our resources. Thankfully, the community has definitely kept pace with us as far as CephFS. So it's a lot further along than us just ignoring it. I was actually telling one of these guys earlier that um, there's a, a, one guy uh, in China who really loved CephFS, loved it so much. Uh, and he, over the last six to eight months, has submitted like 800 patches to CephFS. The guy's a machine, he's a monster, uh, but we love him. And that's why CephFS is probably a lot shorter roadmap uh, than it would have otherwise been now that we're getting back to uh, making it also awesome. So the gateway. Uh, the gateway, it's, again, that same horizontally scalable mantra that Sage started out with. Uh, you can have as many gateways, you can spin up six, eight, 10, 100 of these Rados gateway machines, put them behind a normal load balancer that you would expect. Um, they're, they're pretty rough and tumble. You can you know, rip them out, stick them back in, it doesn't matter. All of the data is stored on the Rados, on, on the cluster. So the, the gateway machines are quite literally just a translator. It's how do we get it in and how do we get it out. Uh, so they're pretty ephemeral. Uh, it's a nice fast socket connection. So really the only overhead that you're gonna see with it is that HTTP overhead. Um, and like I said, we can speak both S3 and Swift. And something that's really interesting that I find incredibly cool, and some people have done some wicked experiments with it, uh, is that you can actually speak both of them, which means I can throw something into the cluster using S3, and I can over here take it back out of the cluster using Swift. Uh, so it can actually act as a translation layer between the two. It's really cool. Um, so yeah, we, we have, it supports all of the normal like buckets and accounting things that you might expect. Uh, it's a little bit closer to the S3 semantics than the Swift ones. We had to make some decisions. We started with S3 first. Um, so uh, something like the, the global namespacing, I think, that's more in S3 than Swift has some like weird sub namespacing stuff. We, you don't have the sub namespacing stuff that you would have with Swift. But pretty much they're both very, consistent to each of those interfaces. Um, but yeah, if I had to pick one that it was closer to, it would be S3. Uh, oh, it's also plugged into Keystone for the OpenStack uh, heads in the audience. So uh, all of the normal accounting and everything that goes on with that, authentication, all that magic, um, it plugs right into that too. So it is a drop-in replacement for Swift and OpenStack setting. All right, the Rails block device. It, like I said, it's a, it's a thinly provisioned block device. So it takes, you know, dev, rbd0, whatever, uh, and it takes a normal block device and it splits it up into a bunch of chunks, throws it out over the cluster, uh, and then takes all of those things via librbd, which sits on top of Libretos, uh, and aggregates them all together, exposes them to a hypervisor, which then can do all the magic that you would expect. Now, what makes this really cool is because you've taken your block device and you've split it up into multiple physical hosts, is that a lot of the workload that goes into this block device can be parallelized. Now what that means is your block device can be arbitrarily large or arbitrarily busy and RBD doesn't care. Uh, so it, you get a lot of really cool benefits from RBD um, or, or by using RBD for your, for your block devices. Um, and as I said, this, for the OpenStack folks, and I think I've got a slide later on that will get into this, um, but uh, it, this is what does all the magic behind things like Cinder and Glance. Uh, so RBD plugs in there too. Uh, some other cool benefits that you have when you start decoupling 
the storage infrastructure from your VM infrastructure is that you can do cool things like live migration across uh, hypervisors. Right? You can take one machine and you can move it over here to this other place. Uh, and because it's on a shared storage backend, uh, you don't have any downtime interruption. The user doesn't care. Uh, the other cool thing is that with our OpenStack integration, uh, you can also do things like um, copy and write cloning. Uh, so what this means is, uh, especially for large infrastructure deployments, if I have a golden image, like I have a, an Ubuntu image that I want to spin up in the cloud, and I'm in a large infrastructure, maybe we're going to do a big deployment of something, right? We want to play with our new magical juju stuff. Uh, so we want to provision 100 machines to play with. You can say, from this magical golden machine image, spin up 100 machines or 1,000 machines. And rather than having to copy it that many times, it just starts booting. All 100 of them or all 1,000 of them just immediately start booting up um, off of that golden image. Now, the copy on write clone part is now we have 100 clones. When I write to one of them, all it's going to do is write the delta, the change to the new instance. Everything else is just going to read through straight to the golden image. So you get a lot of really cool benefits by having this kind of shored or shared storage backend. Uh, yeah, we also have, we have a kernel client uh, and a user space client. So KRBD and, uh, is the other, is the kernel client. All right, so the last piece, the nearly awesome, CephFS. Uh, CephFS is a distributed files system um, that you can use in the back end. Now, it has some really cool features. And it was designed in a really cool way. The fact that we have an object store as the bottom layer instead of a block or a file layer at the bottom layer uh, allows us to do some really cool things. Uh, but first and foremost, CephFS has horizontally scalable, again, the, the metadata servers themselves can be horizontally scalable, which means when you have a directory tree and you have a metadata server, uh, you can have one metadata server for the whole thing. He handles all the metadata for everybody. This is not the data, it's the metadata. And actually, that metadata server in turn stores its metadata in the cluster itself. Um, and actually, do we have? Yes. All right. So metadata is just that. It's the piece that you don't need unless you're using CephFS. If you're using CephFS, that's the third type of machine in your cluster. Uh, you just need a few of them. Or maybe not if you've got a really busy one, you need a lot of them. But what it'll allow you to do is it has a thing called dynamic subtree partitioning. So what this allows you to do is I've got a big directory tree. And based on the heat of any portion of it, each of these guys can start sharing the load. And I can say, well, half of it goes to this guy over here because that's really not busy. And these three guys will split the remaining tree amongst them and then accept all the way down to a single file. You can have a metadata server that will serve the metadata for a single file if it gets busy enough. And it uses like bloom filters and stuff to decide how busy something is. Uh, but it's really cool because it does this on the fly and it will change and shift uh, as those bloom filters tell it something's busier or not. Sorry, I'm getting over cold. Uh, so yeah, that's the metadata server. Uh, again, only required if you're using CephFS. Yeah, hit everything. Cool. All right. I know we got some OpenStack fans. This is how Ceph plugs into OpenStack. Uh, so this is CephFS notwithstanding, you've got, uh, do I have the, oh, no. All right. Uh, so you've got Rados Gateway. That plugs into Keystone and Swift. And... Cinder, Glance, and I guess Nova as well, uh, if you want to talk about that, uh, all served by RBD. Now, I have seen some really cool instances where people have decided, you know what, I know you said CephFS is nearly awesome, but we know that our use case will be fine, so don't worry about it. And they've gone ahead and they've used CephFS, and they've done some really cool stuff. Like, I know one guy uh, was working on the fact that his images for his hypervisors were stored in CephFS so that they would be replicated out to all of his hypervisor machines. So every time he spun up a machine, it was locally, uh, it, was, it was local to that hypervisor and he just started spun it, spun, spinning it up. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, so yeah, CephFS has some definitely cool implications for OpenStack world potentially, uh, but again, nearly awesome. Uh, I guess we'll take a brief pause here. I think I'm still good on time. Uh, any, any major questions on the, or in the architecture portion, infrastructure stuff? Uh, I don't want to like 
go on about the community stuff and like have it lost. Yeah. Okay. So the, the question is, is there support for other operating systems beyond Linux? Um, I know there's some BSD folks that were playing with it. Uh, we aren't really focused there right now, although we, uh, we have several projects like uh, there's a Hyper-V project. We want to start getting uh, integration into the Microsoft world because a lot of people have been leaning on us to do it. Um, but right now, yeah, it's mostly Linux centric for the most part. So, but more is coming. Security, security yeah. So uh, Ceph authentication and security in Ceph is actually handled by something called CephX. It's Kerberos-like, but it was home rolled. So we did our own thing because there were a lot of other solutions that had to be accounted for in a distributed setting. Uh, that you know Kerberos wouldn't necessarily handle, but it's Kerberos-like. Um, so CephX is what you're looking for for security. You've pretty much exhausted my knowledge about CephX now. <laughs> uh, so you talked about multiple VMs launching off of the same image and copy on write being awesome. Um, yeah. What is the associated latency with that? I could see a lot of problems with everyone writing their own deltas and then you have to read the delta and the original file and what happens when you do copy on write for a three gig file and like how does that work? Yeah, I mean there's definitely some implications. Um, I'm not the guy to tell you the specifics but I can say that for the most part it's really good uh, because it does create some placeholders and it will read through to the original image. Now when I say original image keep in mind that if you're at 3x replication which is the default it may not all go to the same image either. It will go to one of those copies of the placement group that you're looking for. Because keep in mind, that image also isn't stored as a single thing, or your three gig file isn't stored as a single thing. So it's gonna be looking for like a four meg chunk in the Rados cluster. So those read throughs are gonna go through at the placement group level, I believe. <laughs> Again, I'm not the guy writing it, but for the most part, uh, copy and write cloning, we haven't seen a lot of problems with like super huge latency or anything like that. Oh, a CloudStack fan. All right. I love it. Love it. Love it. One of the few. Uh, so our, um, one of our community guys, uh, Vito Denhollander, he's actually the guy, he works for a company called 42 on in the Netherlands. He's the guy who wrote the integration. He also wrote the Java bindings for Ceph. Um, CloudStack now, I think, can do pretty much everything that OpenStack can. So you can do all of your, uh, the, the object storage stuff. You can do the block storage. And now we have both. Um, there's two RBD formats that you can use. Now you can use RBD2 format in CloudStack. Um, so I think it's pretty much where it needs to be. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, yeah, so I mean CloudStack is coming right along. Um, both CloudStack and Open Nebula in the last six months have come a long way in terms of the cloud story and their integration with Ceph. So yeah. Okay, so the, the question is about crush and what happens if you change your mind, like you made some crush rules and you wanna change later on how those crush rules behave or how many copies you have or something. Um, you're actually able to, the, the crush map is a live editable thing. So you can download and decompile your crush map and say, okay, uh, let's change the weighting on these machines or this pool needs to have 4x replication or whatever. You push that back up to the cluster and crush says, okay, and just does it. So just, it will handle it live. Yeah, it'll start rebalancing between the OSDs uh, as it needs to. How does Ceph handle if you have like a heterogeneous network where you have um, different network speeds and some may be unpredictable on some nodes? Uh, specifically, if you have a block device and you get maybe to the middle of it and you have you know, some network latency come up, like does it start ballooning memory in your kernel as it has to fulfill that request? I won't answer the very last part of that question because I'm not the guy to answer that question. I will, however, say that the way that we typically suggest people to engineer their, their architecture for Ceph, it's very redundant, simply because we are very big on the no single point of failure. That includes network. Oh, right, it was slow, yeah, okay. So the other part of what I was gonna say, you know, in addition to, well, with the network, uh, if you're running into slow network, it will use the other part of the loop or whatever, but, but moving beyond that, uh, one of the great parts, and, and can also be some of the frustrating parts for new people getting used to how to admin a Ceph cluster, is once you start getting into the really fine-grained performance tuning and how to squeeze every ounce of blood out of that turnip, uh, is there are so many levers in Ceph that you can pull to adjust things. Like you can adjust your network timeout for the latency on the OSDs. Uh, you know, a lot of people would see um, 
So I can think of one good example where a customer had uh, decided they wanted to go WAN scale with Ceph, which really wasn't recommended given the latency between the sites. Uh, and they saw a lot of problems with flapping OSDs. They would go up and down and up and down and up and down. And data was constantly rebalancing and then saying, oh, no, we didn't need to rebalance. Never mind. Forget that. Uh, and so they messed with their timeouts, and it actually fixed it for them. Uh, so there are a lot of configurable options within Ceph. Um, a nauseatingly large amount of configurables in Ceph when you really get down to it, which is, I mean, ultimately why Ink Tank came to be, right? And why Ink Tank was ultimately relatively successful, which was because when you get down to tuning a Ceph cluster, sure, when you just plug it in and use it, it's great. But if you want to make it super great, that's a lot of work uh, on the front end, on just knowing how all those levers work. So, yeah, there's a lot of different options in terms of tuning and, and all that stuff. Before Red Hat bought Ink Tank, how many companies were using Ceph? Yeah. I don't know, Chris, you can probably answer that better than I can. How many were using Ceph? Ceph? Yeah, yeah, just how many customers did we have before the acquisition? How many customers? Oh, yeah, well, as, as far as people just using it, uh, you know, commercial cu customers, hundreds, I guess. But, um, I mean, we had a lot of really nice flagship customers that we, how, who, is, who is administering Ceph clusters? Yeah, yeah, so hundreds of customers of ours, but there were also huge numbers of people in the community utilizing Ceph for various things that we didn't even know about, some we still don't know about. Uh, actually, uh, the NUDT guys, uh, National University of Defense Technology uh, in China, the guys with the biggest supercomputer in the world, uh, we think, uh, we didn't know for a long time that they were using Ceph. We just saw that these guys from China kept like submitting patches or writing on the mailing list. and. Finally, they came to a, a Ceph developer summit online, and we realized that, oh my gosh, it's a bunch of guys from the NUDT in China, and they were all like collectively working together, and they have a big Ceph cluster, and they're actually uh, taking, you know, at some points in time, Ceph is serving that giant supercomputer. So, yeah, that was amazing, and we didn't know about it for a long time. Ceph actually scales down really well, uh, and that's, that's all because of, uh, you know, kind of that, again, the horizontal scalability thing. So, yeah, you, if you want to scale it up, you can plug in one machine or 100 machines and it will just go to town, but you can also scale it down really easily. He's in the back here. Again. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm glad you brought up NUDT and HPC because that's the world I'm from and that's why I'm here because I've been hearing a lot of people talk about it. Can you talk about how it's being used in HPC? Like, is it being used as a competitor for Lustre and GPFS? You know, it's funny you say that. Ceph was original, like the mission statement behind creating Ceph was to create a distributed file system that would be a better luster. That's what it was originally was. And we've kind of gone on this tangent around the outside of object and block, and now we're just getting back to the file system. But remember I said it was written originally as a Department of Energy grant, right? Uh, the three national US laboratories uh, are all still using Ceph, and they're using CephFS. And we still get patches and stuff from them. So in their use case, apparently, it does really well. Uh, now, the broader HPC use case in general, um, we're, we're waiting for CephFS to be awesome, right? Because then that is what's going to solve a lot of the specific use cases for HPC. Uh, we were at SC13 last year. We're going to go back and do it again. There's a lot of people that are really anxious to see CephFS, because then their HPC workloads will be plug and play. They absolutely use it. They're probably our favorite customer. Oh, yeah? Yes. They were one of the first big customers that, that uh, Ink Tank had. Um, yeah, Tim Bell, Dan Vanderster, those guys, um, they had a really small pet project that they started Ceph with to prove it out. And then it turns out that random other groups at CERN started going, hey, that's, that's kind of cool. Can we, can we play with that? They're like, yeah, give us some money. We'll add a little bit here, and it can be your, you know. And, and so it just kind of grew and grew and grew. Uh, and now, uh, again, with the CephFS part, they're looking at potentially trying to get accelerator data on it late this year or early next. Um, but yes, CERN is a big, big user of Ceph. One more quick question. Oh, yeah, all right. Uh, just to follow up with that. So do you have anyone parallel to you focusing on the HPC community, or would that still be you? Uh, it's, as far as I know, it's still us. No one has really come forward and said, we're going to be awesome at Ceph. Two. <laughs> no, but I mean like you as a person. Me Are, as a person? Yeah, like if I wanted to talk to someone about using oh, Ceph and uh, HPC, should I talk to you or should I give you my business card to pass along to someone else? You can give me your business card and I will pass along. The guy you want to talk to is, um, is Mark Nelson. Okay, He is, Thank he you. is the guy to talk to. And he's actually, if you come to the Ceph channel on IRC, he's NHM. 
Okay. Mark Nelson, he's the guy. He's the one who does all of our performance crazy stuff, or leads it anyway. Uh, and he's a big HPC head. He came from that side of the world. Thank you. So Red Hat now owns Gloucester and Ceph? That's correct. And so what's going to happen? Are they going to have some strange like offspring com combination <laughs> of them both? You know, it's funny you say that. So, so all right, so this will be in my community thing later, but I got to plug it. So Ceph Day Boston is next week. If anyone wants to go like talk to me, I'll hook you up with like a 75% discount code or something like crazy. But one of the talks next week at Ceph Day Boston uh, on Tuesday, I think, the 10th, uh, is, uh, if you, you know Jeff Darcy from the Gluster world, okay. Jeff Darcy, he, when, when we came on board uh, with Red Hat, he said, oh, these two things, there's gotta be a way for them to work together. So he made this crazy Franken-baby with like Ceph underneath, he, in Rados, he used Liberados, and he plugged in Gluster on top of Ceph. Weirdest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, but no, to answer your question, honestly, uh, even if I had a crystal ball, I probably couldn't answer that question. Um, <laughs> Ceph and Gluster have very different use cases in which they excel right now. Um, I don't know what the future is going to look like when CephFS hits those streets. It's a big question mark and nobody really knows. Yeah. What's that? I am not the guy to answer that question. <laughs> but I mean, so ultimately keep in mind the architecture, right? Ceph at the, at the lowest level is an object store. Gluster at the lowest level is files, right? So I mean, there's, you can kind of infer some differences there maybe. Uh, probably better than I can, uh, but yeah, it's really a big question mark. When CephFS hits, there is the potential for them to be direct competitors, and so uh, we're still figuring out how that works. Uh, you can't control the performance hits uh, for certain things, uh, and it's pretty wild. Some of the like. A lot of my testing when I did early experimentation, like when I did Juju deployment of Ceph when Juju first came out, I did it to Amazon because they'd already written all the magic for Juju just to like plug stuff into Amazon and it was like, oh, this is easy, this is great. Then I started using that Ceph cluster and all of a sudden I would just have these random like massive latency spikes or it, it, there's just weirdness. And I, ultimately I don't know why, I just know there's crazy weirdness. It's not really where you want to use it. <laughs> yeah. What, what monitoring tools do you provide or APIs that you provide from a monitoring? You know, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, as a commercial product, we had something called Ink Tank Ceph Enterprise, and it provided a tool called Calamari. Calamari was kind of the first, uh, <laughs> it was the first monitoring tool to kind of go out there, and when, when it was a commercial product, Calamari was actually closed source, because our investors all said, we won't give you money unless you have something you hand to the customer. It was stupid. But now, because Red Hat bought us, uh, it was probably my favorite part of the announcement. Uh, fri last Friday, we pushed Calamari out the door. It's now open source. Uh, so there is a monitoring tool for Ceph. And more than that, it's actually a management platform. So longer term, you'll be able to do more than just monitor your cluster. You'll be able to do things like deploy new nodes and uh, manage your pools and manage authentication, all that stuff from Calamari and it's open source. Not yet, but soon. <laughs> Not yet. Um, there, there is one customer of ours that does use it on WAN scale, um, Deutsche Telekom. The problem with them saying that they use it on WAN scale is they control all of the fiber in between these WAN points. <laughs> <laughs> So it's not really WAN scale. You know, it's like, hey, I've got 10 millisecond pings over 400 miles or something. You know, yeah, it's not, not real world for anyone else. Uh, but yes, yeah, soon, there's, there's actually a number of initiatives in Ceph, in the Ceph community, that want to see Ceph at WAN scale. And ultimately, Sage wants to get back to that. He wants to make a Rados cluster that has provisions for handling WAN scale. And one of um, uh, MIMOS, so it's a, a, the R&D research wing for the Malaysian government. Uh, they're working on a project potentially um, with the, uh, uh, someone who has a big dark fiber network, and they want to start working on making Ceph WAN scale. Uh, so they're probably the ones that are at the forefront of that effort, but not here yet. No, no. There, I, well, I shouldn't say no. Not that I know of. Uh, there may be. Uh, that's one of the pieces that will come as we start getting, because as we expand and you're going to have WAN scale, you're going to have to have things like availability zones, and you'll have to be able to start saying things like, well, I want three replicas, and I need one in each of my three availability zones, or whatever. Um, but we don't have that yet, really, not, not in any meaningful context. Yeah? Could you comment more on uh, data corruption and self-correction? 
In what context? In terms of preventing your data from going corrupt uh, on the disk stores. Okay. Um, so at the most basic level, Ceph, as a default, has 3x replication, so straight mirroring copies of three pieces of or three copies of your data. Uh, with the most recent release, Firefly, uh, we also introduced the concept of tiering and erasure coding. So what that means is, uh, I, I don't know if people are familiar with, anybody familiar with tiering and erasure coding? Erasure coding specific? Not a lot. Okay, erasure coding is, <laughs> I just gave an interview with this the other day and I realized I don't have a good elevator pitch for erasure coding. Um, erasure coding is basically, instead of having three physical copies of your data, you have 1.4 copies of your data plus parity. And what this means is it takes a lot less space to store your data, uh, but uh, it also takes a lot longer to recover if you have a failure. It's what, huh? Network rate. Network rate, yeah, okay. <laughs> That's good, I'm gonna use that. Um, and so what, we, what we've started introducing is, is we have the idea of kind of tiering your storage within Ceph. You can say, by on a pool per pool basis, you can say, all right, I have my pool cold. So all my cold storage, the stuff that I don't care about a whole lot, you know, my taxes, I get it out once a year, right? That stuff gets pushed to a cold layer, which is erasure coded. So it takes a lot less space, uh, but you know, we, we, it's not critical data. We, you know, if we have an outage, it's okay that it takes 10 hours to recover or whatever. Um, then there's your normal storage, which can be on like, you know, spinning rust, whatever. Uh, and then maybe you have some really Michigan critical data uh, and you say we get in and out writes, reads all the time uh, and that's on our SSDs. That's tiering. The idea of you know, a bloom filter again, like the heat of a data, will push it up or down uh, the tier that you go through. Um, so, but to answer your question in terms of uh, data resilience, uh, by default it's 3x replication and you get to decide that. You get to decide how many copies, where those copies live, that's what, the magic of your crush map. Uh, and now you also have the tool of erasure coding to say, not as mission critical, don't take three times the space. I just had a question about uh, placement. Uh, do you have any way to base it on file types or file names and say like, I just want this type of file in the, you know, the really uh, slow storage, you know, or No, like that? sorry, I thought you were like giving me a five minute warning or something. Uh, no, but to get, all right, to get back to your, your data resilience question. Um, I don't have that on here, but it's done on a placement group, so it's not done on a whole file, because like I said, your files ultimately get split down into, and again, it's configurable, but I think default's like a four meg chunk. Uh, and so the OSDs are constantly peering with each other, and they'll know, it, you know, machine number 34 had the copy of placement group number 128. Now that machine is gone, and the other two machines in your cluster, ostensibly, if you have 3x replication, know that that guy's gone, and so using Crush, they say, okay, now the new calculation says that data piece, that data chunk needs to live on machine number 47. And so they will write a copy behind uh, on the network, uh, uh, on the cluster network, will replicate that to bring it back up to uh, the 3x replication. So it handles all of that kind of self-healing stuff on its own. Oh, you're saying in terms of like the hash of the data itself. Oh. Okay. So not lost data, but corrupted data. I didn't lose a node, I didn't lose a disk. All right. I, I, don't have, I don't have a good idea that my data has good integrity. Yes. We absolutely have stuff that handles that, and I have no idea what the actual answer is. <laughs> uh, I do know the answer is yes, we have that. Uh, hit me up afterwards, or come see me on IRC or something. I'll plug you into the guys who can intelligently answer that question. Uh, turns out really, really well. Um, <laughs> I know, I'm just full of just bigger and, and happiness, but uh, there's actually been a couple of customers that use Ceph for their log stash, and their log data is millions of really, really small files, uh, and they got, they, they did some tuning, they worked with Mark, uh, and they tuned their cluster, they got some amazing I.O. out of that with really small stuff, so I know it works well, yeah. What doesn't Ceph do? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, make me breakfast. Uh, you know, um, it doesn't do file systems really well right now, yeah? So it's FFS is coming, it's coming soon. Uh, no, I mean, there's, there's definitely some workloads uh, where we saw um, there was somebody who wanted to use, 
I know. Ultimately, what it doesn't do well is really, really fine tuning for people that don't know Ceph well yet. So, I mean, that's true with any system maybe, but it, it shouldn't go without saying, right? Y you can get 80% of the way there easily. The last 20% is really, really hard because there's lots of moving pieces in a Ceph cluster when you're talking about performance tuning. So performance tuning is actually one of the things that we've had to struggle a lot with um, simply because there's no easy way to say, hey, if you want good I.O. on big block devices, do this, because it's never that easy. So performance tuning is something that's definitely a challenge. Uh, there isn't one. There isn't one. No, I, we haven't seen it yet. Um, we've, we've seen thousands to tens of thousands of OSDs in a cluster. And it's, that's what it was designed to do. It was designed to scale to like the exabyte level and beyond with tens of thousands of, of nodes. And, and yes, that is a good point. It was built at data center scale. It was originally built to be a better luster. It was built for data center scale. We want to get beyond that, but we'll see. Yeah. You, okay, so running many, many metadata servers right now is fine because ultimately the architecture by default, unless you go in and mess with stuff, is only, it's, it's hot standby. You know, it's, it's one metadata server. The, the dynamic subtree partitioning is the part that's nearly awesome, or one of the parts that's nearly awesome. But to answer your question, actually, you don't really want to do that. And I know it's hard to get into not having a machine image that you can say, deploy, and have a thousand of those to spin up and go. But if you had a thousand monitors, your cluster would be incredibly unwieldy. Because you don't need that many monitors. Uh, in, well, look at DreamHost. They have two five petabyte clusters. I think they're both running on five monitors each. So I think we had our quick start guide, which was all on a single machine. It was three OSDs and a monitor just for testing and playing around with. You know, I wouldn't recommend that for a workload of any meaningful type. Um, the smallest, well, to give you an idea here, this will probably give you a better idea. Ink Tank, when we build, when we build people, we support them. We do it on the raw size of your cluster. That's how we priced it out. And the lowest tier was, what, 64 terabytes and below. Yeah. So, I mean, huge, right, to most people. Uh, but that said, you know, we've seen people that are running, uh, you know, 100 gig on a Ceph cluster you know, or smaller. I mean, anything. But I don't think I've seen an actual production workload on anything below 50, 60 gig. Um, so the question is uh, CPU requirements and, and machines and all that. Um, I'm not really a hardware guy. I probably won't give you an answer. I know a good rule of, yeah, yeah, well, I don't have it. But um, actually something that's really good, uh, if you just Google uh, dream compute, all one word, um, dream compute architecture, or dream compute reference architecture. Uh, just Google for that, you'll find it. It'll be the first result, it's a PDF. Uh, DreamHost actually wrote up a PDF of all of the stuff, the specs of their machines for the OSDs, the machines for the monitors, their network configuration. Although I will say, it's awesome to read, but their network configuration was wicked overkill. They, they took like just giant buckets of money and they just kind of said, network, activate. Like, it was, it was crazy. Uh, like, 40 gig spine routers with double interconnects, and like, it, you'll see. Lots of money. Not necessary, but it was wicked cool. <laughs> I mean, one good rule of thumb that we had for a while was one core uh, per uh, OSD, but it's not, you don't need that as much anymore, but if you have it, you're, you're good. You can. Um, actually, our quick start guide had three OSDs and a monitor and a metadata server all in one machine. Uh, just using uh, directories. So it was on a single spinning disk. Um, so it's possible. You know, you just have to, to weigh performance versus, you know, what you want to put into it. Um, I think we're probably running into the end of our time here soon. I want to buzz through the community stuff, and then we can answer questions, and, you know, I'll, I will be far more honest when we get to the bar, I'm sure, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so talking about, oh, gosh, some of these slides are outdated. Um, Ceph Developer Summit. We had our giant one a long time ago. Apparently, I put the wrong slide in, sorry. Uh, Ceph Developer Summit, we've got it coming up. Uh, 24th and 25th of June, it's a virtual event. Uh, historically, it's been on Google Hangouts, but I think we're gonna use a thing called Blue Jeans this time around, because then we can get uh, like a whole bunch of people all in a single room. We don't have to, well, anyway. 
Uh, it's a video hangout. We get together, we talk shop about what's going into the next release. Um, this one will be a little different uh, because uh, we usually we're on a quarterly release schedule, right? So we're get, we would get ready to release Firefly and we would talk about what we're gonna do for Giant uh, every quarter. But Firefly got delayed, uh, you know, turns out getting acquired is lots and lots of work. Um, so the Firefly got pushed. Uh, so right now we're kind of in this interim release. So it's gonna be talking about what's still or already in flight for Giant uh, and then also kind of looking down the road a little bit at what's gonna come with Hammer. Uh, and just talk about, you know, where's everybody at status-wise for their projects? Is there new work that people want to discuss? So the format is everybody that wants to do something substantive for Ceph writes up a little blueprint on our wiki. And each of those blueprint gets like a 30-minute window where they can talk to Sage primarily, and Sage can say, yeah, don't do it that way. That's kind of stupid. Uh, you know, unfortunately, he would never say it like that. He's way too nice. Uh, but he'll tell you, like, hey, your idea is really good, but maybe we should do it about, like, this way, or we should think about this and this and this, and the rest of the community can weigh in, and the Blueprint owner can actually use that 30 minutes also as a way to say, hey, I need help with my messaging bus. Like, I don't know anything about that. Can somebody help me out? And they can kind of recruit uh, other members of the community. Uh, the end of CDS, we end up with a whole bunch of things that are saying, hey, this is gonna go into the next release of Ceph. These are the, each of the guys that own these things. Uh, here's a rough idea of how it's gonna get done. Uh, for the people that do work in Ceph, really helpful. For the people that are just really interested about how Ceph has developed, it's great to be a fly on the wall for these things. So keep an eye out for that. Um, what else? Yeah, if you want to contribute, there, I think ceph.com slash contribute. Uh, it'll give you a straight up blueprint on how you start hacking on Ceph. Um, yeah, we shifted to a new wiki a while back. Uh, it's actually a mind touch wiki, if anyone knows what that is. And <laughs> If Aaron, uh, Aaron's the CEO of my touch, if he heard me calling a wiki, I think he just like dies a little inside. Uh, I think they're like an enterprise knowledge based solution or something, I don't know. It's a great <laughs> wiki. <laughs> uh, but this, this basically is the place for all of our developer stuff. So all of our blueprints, all of our Ceph developer summits. If you go back down here on the planning, there's Ceph developer summit. If you go down there, you can actually go into each of our last four summits that we've had uh, and there's time-coded links to each of the YouTube videos um, of each session. So if you, you want to know something about the RDMA work from our Firefly session, you can go watch that discussion and see all the guys that are way smarter than I am talk about it. It's pretty cool. Uh, Google Summer of Code. Yeah, I just figured I'd mention this. Uh, we've got two students that are working for Ceph via the Google Summer of Code. Um, one of them is working on taking our erasure coding stuff to the next level. Um, the other one is working on a Wireshark plugin. That was the other thing. Somebody asked a question about monitoring. Um, the end of the summer, supposedly, uh, we will have a Wireshark plugin uh, that will handle all of the Ceph behind the scenes traffic uh, and will be committed upstream to Wireshark so you'll be able to use it natively. So fingers crossed for that. And Ceph days, so this is what I mentioned earlier. Um, we've had a number of these events, I think six or eight of them. Uh, we had one in New York last year. Uh, we did one in Sunnyvale, California. I think we did one in London, Frankfurt. Um, we had one that was kind of a Ceph day in Malaysia. Um, but Boston, next week, next Tuesday. Uh, come on down if you can get away. Uh, these, guys, these are full day events. Um, we will do them basically anywhere we can get enough people kind of pushed into a room. Uh, and if we can get somebody to kind of say, hey, here's a room, then it happens even faster. But these are awesome. Um, I've been really happy with how these have been turning out. I think Frankfurt, we had like 200 people show up. So it's crazy. Um, it's basically, we take members of the community that are located in that region, and we say, talk about what you're doing with Ceph. Uh, and so we usually get about six or eight guys. They each give a half hour talk or something on, on something cool that they're doing with Ceph. Sage usually shows up at these things and gives his kind of where Ceph's at and where it's going. Um, awesome events. Uh, and meetups, yeah, there's, God, there's probably 20, 30 meetups now uh, around the globe. Um, I, there's one in New York, isn't there, Chris? There's a New York Ceph meetup now, right? That's regularly occurring? Uh, if not, it's coming soon. I just saw it on the list not long ago. Uh, foundation, uh, not a lot to say. Uh, we are looking at potentially moving Ceph into a foundation setup for the actual ownership. Um, we might not need to now that we have Red Hat. Red Hat historically has been a pretty good steward 
of open source projects. Uh, and beyond that, with the distributed copyright, you know, there's really limited impact that any commercial entity could ever do to ceph the project. Um, so don't know where this is headed, but we're still thinking about it. Uh, if you have input or questions, let me know. Uh, and yeah, we've got a whole host of other things that are going on in the community in terms of integrations and crazy stuff like that. Um, you know, if you have specific questions, ask me. Um, one thing I will mention is the Gennetti stuff. It's really cool. Um, so Ceph is in integrated with uh, Google Gennetti. Um, thanks to the Cinefo guys, uh, it's a Greek ISP, whatever. They've got a big thing that they put together with uh, Google Gennetti and Ceph. Um, I forget what it's called. Uh, but anyway. Uh, Uh, I think so. I don't, I don't know all the details. Uh, I haven't really dug into it much. But I know they did a good presentation at GennettiCon uh, in Greece, actually, um, that I think made it up to the web. So if you Google for that, you should be able to see it. Uh, oh, yeah, metrics. If anybody's familiar with the uh, Biturgia dashboard that runs the OpenStack metrics, we've got the same things at uh, metrics.ceph.com. You can check out all the crazy, like, I think the single most interesting thing that I've seen out of our metrics is that Sage is a machine. Like you look at you know the early days of Ceph and Sage is like 98% of the commits, and you look at today, he's still like 40% of the commits. You know I work on the East Coast and he works on the West Coast, and I'll you know get in and to my machine at like seven in the morning, and I'll see you know Sage has committed to the project 47 minutes ago. Dude, go to bed. Uh, I, I guess his wife is like a surgical resident or something, so like he just works her hours and doesn't sleep. I don't know. It's, it's, he's insane. Uh, oh, yeah. If you wanted to look at Calamari, that's kind of what it looked like um, six months ago. It's come a long way. Uh, but yeah, it's got some neat data viz stuff. Uh, it'll actually show all of your OSDs as little green dots. And if you have a problem with one, it gets a little bit bigger and it gets yellow. And if it goes down or something, gets much bigger and it gets red, you can just click on it and kind of see like, oh, what's going on with that? So, I mean, it's got some cool viz, uh, some neat stuff with graphite uh, and whatnot, but uh, it's not gonna be nearly as interesting as maybe in another three months uh, when it starts getting the actual like, hey, we can plug in new nodes and do management and stuff, so that'll come soon. Uh, the roadmap, uh, just so you know, um, historically with Ink Tank, this may change. This is actually under a lot of discussion now that we're part of Red Hat, because we'll have way more QA resources. Uh, but historically, we would have a release every quarter. Every other quarter, we would have kind of a long-term supported release. This may change. Uh, but for now, that's kind of what it looks like. Firefly, we just launched. Like I said, it was late. Um, Firefly is what introduced you know, the erasure coding and the tiering and a lot of really big stuff that's been uh, people have been waiting on for a long time. So. Uh, yeah, if you want to get started with Ceph, you can go to ceph.com uh, slash get. That'll take you to a downloads page. You can get the packages or the tarballs or anything that you want to play with there. Um, yeah, the quick start guide that I was talking about, I think if you go to ceph.com slash QSG, um, it gives you a, a, takes you right to a place where it just says do these you know, 10 steps or whatever the heck. And you've got a Ceph cluster that you can play with. Um, our docs, for those of you that don't, don't know, the Ceph docs are awesome. Like, I've worked on a lot of open source projects, and the documentation is usually, uh, it's usually bes somewhere between a newspaper you find on the subway and, and, and like yesterday's lunch wrapper. It's pretty bad. Uh, but our docs are, have, have, were really impressive to me, because I came on and I was actually able to get up to speed really quickly. Uh, and those were all done by one guy for a long time. John Wilkins is just a monster. And for those of you that have ever written docs, you know it's not an easy task. And he was never given release notes. He would just crawl the code and say, oh, hey, here's something new. I should write that up. So he turned, he literally turned code into documentation. The guy's, he's a little off. I, you know, he's got, there's something wrong with somebody that's able to do that, I think. But, uh, but yeah, and if you have help, uh, you can go to ceph.com slash help or if you need help. Um, we've actually got a really cool community support program uh, where volunteers <coughs> from different people in the community will actually schedule office hours. Well, they'll be in IRC and they'll watch the mailing list for a certain number of hours each week uh, so that you know you won't get radio silence if you come during one of those times. Um, and they'll be there to answer questions and whatnot. So 
Uh, and that's not just ink tankers. We have a bunch of shifts, but that's not just us. So uh, there's always a way to get an answer. I think that's it. So 